Thank you for joining us for a little service this evening. I've asked Kelly to sing a song before I preach something that I really feel like God has laid upon my heart for this hour. I preached this in one of our online revivals for a, a, a local church uh, back several months ago. But man, I tell you, God's been just pressing this on me for me in this hour. I, I don't want to stay the same. I want to be better. I want to be closer to Christ. I want to be more Christ-like. I want to be different. Lord, don't let me stay the same. Oh, God, let that be our prayer, Lord. I don't want to be the same. I don't want to be stuck just like I've always been. Sing it, Kelly Joe. I want to be different, I want to be changed, till all of me is gone, and all that remains is a fire so bright, the whole world can't see that there's something slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering to us word not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens shall be on fire, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 
Would you stretch your hands toward heaven and ask the Lord to touch us in this place? Father, these next few moments, help me to deliver clearly what you have laid upon my heart, Lord, for myself and for my family and for everyone that would listen, Lord, to what I would say from your word. God, give us ears to hear it, grace to receive it and to believe it and to respond to it. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone can say amen, amen. So we turn to God's word for direction and we find in its pages guidance and comfort. We read and we believe that all scripture is given for inspiration, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In our text, the Holy Ghost, using Peter, lays out the truth of what is coming in our future. The world is going to be dissolved. Listen, this earth is not permanent. It doesn't matter what anybody is preaching, what anybody is prophesying. The word is very clear. This world is going to dissolve. It's going to end. Our world system is going to end. Our world government is going to end. Our economy is going to end. The whole world is going to dissolve. And so Peter is teaching us this truth. And in, in the midst of teaching the truth, he asks us a question. It is the question of the hour, a question I want to ask us here just, just a moment. What manner of persons ought we to be? That's a big question. Let's, let's work our way down to that in this passage. I want you to notice something in particular about verse number nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You, you know what I see clearly in that verse? I see unbelievable mercy. Hallelujah. God having unbelievable mercy on us. Now, some men believe and teach that God has delayed his coming because he has changed his plan. God, God's no longer going to do this. God's changed his plan. He's going to build his kingdom here in this world and in our within our system. But that they believe that God is like a man, that he makes a promise with good intentions, but for whatever reason, he cannot or does not keep his promise. You know, a man's plans may change with time. A man may lose his ability to keep his promise or lose his interest in his promise or he may be distracted by some other event in life that takes priority. Or a man may completely forget that he ever made a promise. But none of these things can ever apply to God. Men may project their own human weaknesses upon God and decide that God's long delay in judging the world must mean that his plan has changed or that his promise has failed. But rest assured, God has not forgotten God will fulfill his word. Now, if you feel like God's promise has been delayed, it is not delayed because God is like a man. The promise 
is not slack. God's promise is not slack. It is not loose. It is not inactive. It is not lazy or lethargic or, or it's not negligent. God's promise is not slack as some men count slackness. So why has the Lord delayed His coming? He has delayed His coming because of His unbelievable mercy. God is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish. Oh, hallelujah. If God Excuse me, if God has delayed his coming, it's not because he's not God or changed his mind. It's because he is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but willing that all should come to repentance. The fact that God has delayed seemingly his judgment is evidence that he wants to supply ample time and space for all men to repent. If God has paused his plan, it's because of his unbelievable mercy. Every person in the world should consider this fact that you and I have not been destroyed for eternity in our sin because, solely because, God is merciful. Oh, hallelujah. I thank God that He hasn't judged the world yet because there's so many people that are not taking advantage of His mercy. He will come. But right now, He is exercising unbelievable mercy. Now, this should not be taken as an indication that God will not eventually judge sin, including our sin. But take it as a clear indication, God's not willing to perish, and that's all. God sincerely desires the salvation of everyone, the eternal bliss in heaven of every human. He waits for you and I to turn to him, but that does not mean he will not bring judgment upon sinners eventually and on this world. Though God suffers long in waiting for men everywhere to repent with unbelievable mercy, I must preach to you this undeniable truth. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It is an undeniable truth. It is not God's will for any to perish, yet millions will defy God's will, refuse to repent, and will not be ready when He comes. God's coming to most of the world will be to them as a thief breaking in in the middle of the night. It is an undeniable truth. God will keep His word. The earth, including everything we hold dear, will perish. Isaiah says it like this, the earth is utterly broken, broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved, and the earth is moved exceedingly. This is the prophet Isaiah. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be moved like a cottage. The transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fail it shall fall and not rise again. More prophecy from Isaiah. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled up together as a scroll. And all their host shall fall down as a leaf falleth from the vine and as a fig falling, as a falling fig from the fig 
tree. Please hear me, saints of God. Please hear me. Believe not me, but believe the Word of God and tell your friends and tell your children and tell your grandchildren and tell your parents and tell your families and tell your communities God will judge the world. It is an undeniable truth. The world cannot last. The world will not last. Listen to the very words of Christ. You say, I don't want those old prophets. Tell me what Jesus said. Okay. Matthew 24. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour the Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh the world is winding up. Look around. The mess of this world is getting messier. There's so much hate. There's so much hostility. There's so much anger. There's so much confusion. Can we read the signs by the prophets? I've been hearing, I would say, the end is nearing. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Oh God, help us. Help us, Lord, to know this undeniable truth. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That is the truth laid out before us tonight. And America cannot be spared. Can, can, I, can I preach to you just a moment? In all of the end time prophecy in the whole book, Old Testament, New Testament, all the way through the book of Revelation, there is no clear picture of America anywhere in end time prophecy. Now, I know preachers that believe America might be here and America might be there. And this could be America, but there is no clear consensus that this particular thing pictures America in end time prophecy. So where is America? America is the world superpower right now in 2020. The world superpower. Nothing happens in the Middle East without us being involved. Nothing, nothing happens there without America being involved. But in end time prophecy, when the nations come down against Israel and they come to destroy Israel and they're going to, and God himself raises up and fights for Israel and that ushers in the kingdom of God, there is no clear picture of an outside influence, a nation from somewhere else coming in to, 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 to protect Israel as we have and to be the friend of Israel as we have and as I believe we ought to be in fulfilling the scripture, they that bless Israel shall be blessed. I think America has been blessed because of our positive Positive position toward Israel most of the time and I think we ought to remain that way but where is America coming in like the knight in shining armor to protect Israel in end time prophecy America is not there so something I have no idea what we're not given a picture of it because we're not told anything about it I'm just I'm trying to figure here what prevents America from playing the part on the world stage that we have played for a hundred years what, what prevents that I I don't know has America has her government collapsed has her economy collapsed has the health of her people collapsed has 
Has some pestilence destroyed us? Has some army destroyed us? Some Armageddon-like event brought us down? Or, or are we just torn down because of from the inside because of moral decay and 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 hatred against God and and does it collapse upon itself like every other world power has ever done they've all got greedy they've all had more than they could could, could contain and use and it just kept pushing and pushing and sin got so great sin got so so mighty that the nation collapsed uh, inwardly upon itself is, is that what's going to happen to America I'm not prophesying to you right now I want you to think about this something happens that brings America down this world is going to perish and America is not going to save it. President Trump is not going to save it. President Biden or whoever comes after him is not going to save the world. America is no longer going to be the savior of the world. It's an undeniable truth that this world is going to roll up like a scroll. This world is going to perish. That's, that's undeniable in the Word of God. And so that undeniable truth that the Lord is coming to rule and reign, to set up a new heaven and a new earth, and reign in righteousness, that's undeniable truth. It produces an unavoidable question, and Peter gives us that question. Verse 11, seeing then, with all this truth established, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? Wow. What a question, Peter. What a question. A question from 2,000 years ago that's as relevant in 2020 as it has ever been. If the world is coming to a conclusion, what kind of people should we be? Or let's bring it right down where the rubber meets the road. What kind of person should I be? What manner of persons ought ye, ought we, to be. It is a question that really demands an answer. The facts are in front of us. If you're not satisfied with the facts, please read the Bible. Don't, don't take my word. Read Peter. Read 1 Thessalonians. Read 2 Thessalonians. Read the book of Daniel. Read the book of Ezekiel. Read the book of Revelations. The facts are in front of us. The world must come to a conclusion. What will we do what manner of persons ought we to be and the answer to peter's question is par partially in the question itself what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness that word conversation very often in the new testament and here means manner of life what kind of person should I be in my holy manner of life and godliness? What kind of person should I be in an unholy world, in an ungodly system? The answer is there, isn't it? In everything we are, in everything we should be, in everything that we have the potential to be, the one thing that we should be in this horribly wicked world is holy. The worse it gets, the better we as the people of God ought to be. Listen, the worse this world gets, the less I want to be like it. The more I see of this world in the press and in the entertainment industry and in sports and in 
casinos and drinking and, and all the pleasurable things that this world is so wrapped up in, the worse that it gets, the less that we ought to want to be like them. Instead of hate, I want to love. Instead of anger, I want to demonstrate joy. Instead of division, I want to promote unity. Instead of confusion, I want to sow clarity. The world is killing, but I want to promote life. The world is tearing each other down, but I want to build others up. The world is falling into destruction, but I want to show them a path of, of deliverance. I want to be in this crucial time more like Christ. And so the simple answer, what manner of person ought we to be? We ought to be Christians. We ought to be truly Christ. Like, You know, Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. It was probably given to them as a derogatory term. Those people are like Christ. They're, they're like their dead Savior, the Galilean. <laughs> they didn't take it as a, a badge of shame. They wore it as a badge of honor. Oh, let us be more like Christ. In 2020, what are Christians really like? Hey, I get, I get frustrated watching how some Christians act. If I'm not careful, I'll start comparing myself with them and say, well, I'm not them, but that's not going to gain me anything compare ourselves among ourselves, that's not wise. Oh yeah, I can find Christians right here in this town. I can find Christians in our state. I can, I can find Christians on television, on radio, and on YouTube, and a hundred other places. I can find them all over social media that are not acting very Christ-like. And I can say, shame on them and glory to me. But they're not my standard. Are, 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 you, are you hearing me, saints of God? They're not our standard. They're not our standard. Our standard is Christ. Oh God. When you talk about, you talk about a, an humbling experience. How do I measure up against the religious networks? How do I measure up against the, the Christians that drink and carouse and run and and, and go to nightclubs? How do I measure up against the, the Christians that go in and out of marriage and, and don't value life? How, how do I measure up against these Christians? Well, I might measure up pretty good and still I, until I start measuring because then I become like them. I'm, I'm, I'm judging myself as them, against them. But when I... When I have to measure up against the gold standard, Christ, who is holy, who is righteous, who ever loves, who ever intercedes to the Father. When I have to measure up to the gold standard, who doesn't sin a little bit every day. Oh, y'all helping me preach here? He doesn't sin a little bit every day. He doesn't promote sin. He doesn't enjoy sin. He hates sin sin. When I have to measure Davy against that gold standard, how do I measure up? Hey, why don't you, why don't you answer for yourself and I'll answer for me because I really don't want you answering for me and I have no business answering for you. But that's a pretty high standard, isn't it? With the world, as the old saying is, going to hell in a handbasket, running toward hell as fast as it can. What kind of person should I be? Oh God. What kind of person am I? I want to be Christ-like. I want to be godly. 
Oh, let holiness and godliness be in our description. The fact that this world will melt with fervent heat ought to exert a deep and abiding influence on us. Can, can, I, can I say that again? If you don't get anything I say in, in this little message, I, I want you to get this. The fact that this world is going to melt with fervent heat ought to exert a deep an abiding influence on us. It should induce us to be the very best Christians we can be. We, we excuse ourselves. Well, everybody sins, and that, all of us have fallen, but that's not an excuse to fall again. All of us have made mistakes, yes, yes. Thank God for grace, but that's not an excuse to fall again. I mean, since... Since there's so much grace for sin, since grace abounds and there's plenty of grace for all of our sin, should we continue in sin? That's what Paul asked. Since there's plenty of grace, since we all fall and there's grace for us when we fall down, should we keep on sinning? Paul said, God forbid. That's not what grace is for. Grace is to give us victory over sin. Yes, grace lifts us out of sin, but grace, according to Scripture, also teaches us, yes, the grace of God that's appeared unto all men teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly and godly in this present world. Hey, if you are a grace Christian, then you are a sober Christian. If you are a grace Christian, then you are a holy Christian. If you are a grace Christian, then you are learning from grace to live godly right here in this present world that is falling apart. In order to produce a deep and abiding influence on us. It should induce us to be the best Christians that we can be. You know, there's nothing permanent in this earth. God teach us that fresh. This world is not our abiding home. Our most precious assets are not here. They're not in your bank. They're not in your garage. They're not in your in your safe, they're not in your hiding place wherever you hide your coins and money and valuables. Our, our most precious asset is it's not sitting on that foundation that you are, are paying a 30 year mortgage on. It's, it's not the things you drive. No, no, it's not our reputation. Oh, no. Our most precious assets are in another world. This world is not our home. If, if, if we make a habit of keeping that fact in our mind, we will soon lose our taste for this world. This world is not our home. We're, we're only passing through. That will repress and suppress our worldly ambition. It would lead us to not desire to accumulate what must so soon be destroyed if we kept that in mind. Our home is over there beyond the blue. This world that's going to be destroyed is not our home anyway. Oh, I'm thankful for what God has allowed me to hold in this world. But listen, don't hold what God gives you with a closed hand. No. No, no, no. Number one, you don't want God breaking your fingers to get it out because he can. But you're not going to turn loose of it easy. Hold what God gives you with an open palm. God puts it there. Let him take it. God, God puts a dollar there. Let him have all of it if he wants it. Well, I'll give him 10% of it and thank God for it. But if he asks for the other 90 cents, give it to him. Don't withhold from God. God gives you a fine home. Hold it like that. God gives you a fine automobile. Hold it like that. God gives you a great job with wonderful benefits. 
Hold it like this. And if God says, hey, I want, I want you to have something else, it's not hard. He just takes it and replaces it with something maybe of less value, temporarily less value. God knows what we need. He's going to take it all away eventually. Oh, yeah, he is. None of us are taking things and stuff with us. So let us turn loose of this world and be holy, godly people. What manner of persons ought we to be? How about it, saints? When somebody yells and screams at you, do you get red in the face and scream back? The old joke was Christians don't get mad. They just get red in the face. <laughs> I don't know if we ought to. No. We ought to be meek. Oh, yes, I know. Sometimes we have to be firm for what's ours. But listen, we ought to be meek. We ought to be holy. We ought to be gentle. We ought to be kind. We ought to be righteous. Oh, God. We shouldn't cheat. We shouldn't lie. We shouldn't steal. We shouldn't be vain. We shouldn't be prideful. We shouldn't be caught up in the entertainments and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the lust for other things in this world. Oh, God. It's all passing away. What manner of person ought we to be? We shouldn't be deceitful. We shouldn't be spiteful. We shouldn't be hateful. We should not be bitter. We should not be biting. The unavoidable question will make us indescribably better. Yes, it will. Keep that question. How should I handle this? Seeing that all this is passing away and it's not going to matter in a few hundred years, maybe in a few moments, what kind of person should I be? It will make you indescribably better. Listen to the rest of our text. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him. Watch this. This is where he wants to find us. In peace, without spot, and blameless. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, I thank you for the way you have spoken to us from your word. Change me, Lord. I want to be different. I want to be changed. I don't want to be the same man I've always been. Oh God, I don't want to be a, a, a man that's got to have his way. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be hateful. I don't want to be angry. Lord, I don't want to be a child of this world. I don't want to be caught up in his pleasures and his bondages, Lord. I want to be different. I want to be changed. I want to be the Christian you have called me to be. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. Touch these people, these precious people who are seeing this message now or in the future that we might be the very best Christians that we can ever be. In Jesus' name, we believe it. And everyone says, amen. Thank you for joining us. May God bless you.